This is Michael Smith of MedPage Today. I'm in Washington at the meeting of the International AIDS Society, the International AIDS Conference, and I'm with Dr. Anthony Fauci, who is director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Uh, Dr. Fauci, welcome back to MedPage Today. We've Good to be here. chatted at this meeting many times, Indeed. and uh, it is always, always a pleasure. This is an historic meeting. I think there's no question of that. It's the first International AIDS Conference on American soil in some 22 years. It's certainly the first in Washington, I think, in, in 25. 25 um, and it's, the reason for that long delay was a ban on travel right. imposed on people who are HIV positive. Right. Um, that ban was described uh, by Secretary Sebelius the other night as a bad policy based on faulty science and contrary to the values of the American people. Um, I'm wondering from your perspective as one of the leaders in the science end of this and also the, the question of public response, did that have any effect on, on American science? Did it have any effect on the public perception of the AIDS pandemic? Well, I can tell you it had virtually no effect on American science, because the science proceeded. We, we live in an international community in science, as in many other disciplines, and there were a total of 19 international AIDS conferences from the very beginning. Uh, the first one was actually in Atlanta in 1985, but we've had so many of them, and we interact with each other scientifically that it doesn't matter. What it could possibly have had an impact on is the awareness of the American people about the globality, the global nature of this pandemic. Because when you have an international meeting and you bring people in from all parts of the world with all different types of problems from different regions, Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, the Caribbean, South America, it gives the American people for that week that the meeting is here and the coverage that we get from the media that they get a feel that this is really a serious global problem. So I think an awareness on the part of the American people of the globality of the problem clearly had to be affected to some extent by not having the meeting in the United States for the last 22 years. The science, I don't think it has any effect on that. Mm -hmm. Well, as you say, the scientists, of course, are going to the meetings and, of course, they're talking exactly. throughout. The meeting is also historic in the sense that for the first time in a long time, people are talking about a cure for, for HIV, they're talking about a vaccine for HIV, and Secretary Clinton this morning, and as she has said for many times in the last several months, uh, is, is, is dreaming of an AIDS-free generation. Mm -hmm. You, at a meeting earlier this week, uh, to discuss the prospects of cure, were very cautious about curing HIV, right. and yet the Secretary is talking about ending, ending AIDS, and I think there may be some difficulty yes. with people's understanding of that. Can we unpack it a bit? Yeah, I, I welcome the opportunity to try and uh, clarify that a bit. Uh, when people talk about a cure or a vaccine, uh, a cure is an aspirational goal that still is in its infancy of scientific knowledge. Cure being you have drugs, you put people on and you suppress the virus, they're doing really well, but you try and get to the point where you could discontinue the drug and they'd still continue to do well. We are just beginning to understand the nature of the reservoirs that make that a very formidable uh, project to engage upon. We're going to try and we do hope we will cure. The same with the vaccine. With the vaccine, we're a little bit more ahead because we have one vaccine trial that showed some modest efficacy, and we're now trying to relate potential correlates of immunity to see how the next generation would do better, but it's still years and years away. That's a research issue. What we're talking about and what I spoke about in my, in my uh, plenary lecture and what the secretary and others were referring to is ending the AIDS pandemic within a reasonable time frame. And ending the pandemic is an epidemiological consideration, which means, according to the definition that Secretary Clinton herself said, no children born with HIV infected. Sharp decrease in the incidence globally of HIV infection, and everyone to the best extent possible who's infected is on therapy and leading a relatively normal life. That's putting an end to the pandemic as we know it. The confusion between that and the cure, they are quite different. That doesn't mean we don't want to get a cure. 
or we don't want to get a vaccine, but what we're saying at this meeting, turning the tide, is that we already have, and that's the point I emphasize very strongly in my plenary lecture, we have 30 years of experience of scientific advances, some breakthroughs like the discovery of the virus, some incremental, like understanding pathogenesis and the various intricacies, other types of breakthroughs like in 1996 when we finally got the triple combination of drugs that actually was able to drop the level of virus to below detectable level for a sustained period of time. All of that accumulation of knowledge has led to interventions which over the past few years, interventions in the form of treatment and interventions in the form of prevention, which has showed that under the conditions of a clinical trial, you can show they work. So there's no more confusion or argument, does this work or that work? Circumcision works. Mother-to-child transmission prevention works. Pre-exposure prophylaxis on the, the optimum conditions works. Microbicides can work. Treatment as prevention works. All of those things work. What's happened most recently is that we've now, due to the global programs like PEPFAR, the Global Fund, the NGOs like the Clinton Foundation, the Gates Foundation, now that has been expanded, that implementation at a much more advanced global level. Where we have shown it's done right, it shows not only if efficacious in a trial, it's effective on the ground. So right now, the science has taken us from basic and clinical science to intervention to implementation. So what we're saying is that there are no scientific excuses now to say, well, we don't have the scientific tools to do this. True, we don't have a vaccine, and true, we don't have a cure, but you could still implement in a scaled up way the interventions we have now to have a major turning point in the epidemic. And by turning point, I mean the trajectory of the curve going down like this. It's coming down already. For example, mm -hmm. last year there were 2.7 million new infections. This year, there's two, this year being 2011, the last year we counted, was 2.5 million. So it's going down gradually. If you want a sharp decline, we already have the tools. But the big caveat that I said in my plenary and that the secretary said is that this is not going to happen spontaneously because now we've got to implement mm -hmm. these on a global level. Countries have to take ownership. We need more donors who have not yet entered the field, countries that have sort of stood in the background. We need to have efficiencies. We need to scale up regionally and appropriately. We need to get rid of stigma. We need to get rid of the political and the other kinds of obstacles in the way. All of those things need to be done. And then we say there's no excuse not to end the pandemic. When is it going to happen? I get asked that all the time now. We don't know. It depends on what we do. Mm -hmm. So the answer is we can do it. The question is, will we do it? So in a sense, um, the science is in on, on ending the pandemic. That's right. what you're saying. It now depends on people, the world, making the decision to go ahead and use right. that, that science. That doesn't mean the science is finished because we still have to get long-acting drugs, better microbicides. A vaccine would be the real showstopper because if we could insert in that combination prevention package a vaccine that's reasonably effective, better than 31%, which was the mm -hmm. only trial we have, but a, but a moderately successful vaccine. When you combine it with other prevention modalities, that's important. So there's a lot of important science mm -hmm. to be done. However, even without that, we could start heading towards a deflection in the curve. Okay, let me, let me go back a bit to the issues of, of cure and vaccine for just a moment. Uh, you said, I think, on Friday, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing now, that that research on the cure is in the basic discovery stage. Yes. We are, but, you, but the, the view in the community, I guess, at the moment is that that basic discovery can proceed. There's, it's not an impossible task, as Absolutely. was thought for many years. Right. That's correct. But the confusion is saying that cure equals ending the pandemic. No. You can end the pandemic, which is an epidemiological definition. 
without ever curing anybody. Mm -hmm. You could cure a small number of people and have the epidemic go out of control. They're different. Right. They're different. That's important. It's an important distinction to be made, and I think, uh, I think you've made it very clearly. The meeting always has an effect on the community, uh, the broader community, the political community, the financial community. The secretary and you and others have called for the political will to end this. Right. Do you expect to see any kind of supercharging of that political will? Well, what I'd like to see is more countries in the developed world get into the ball game and step up to the plate about being part of the partnerships with the developing world. There have some, been some countries that have not put in as much as we really feel they should. Also, what we're seeing in a very gratifying way is that many of the countries that received a lot of money through programs such as PEPFAR or the Global Fund are now starting to assume much more of an ownership of their problem and are allocating resources to help solve their own problem. So the problem in the developing world in Sub-Saharan Africa is being solved by Africans now. It's, it's, it's an interesting shift. It isn't just mm -hmm. donor and recipient. It's partnerships and country ownership. Right. So reason for optimism, but not for complacency. Without a doubt. I mean, anybody who thinks when we walk out of this meeting that the ball game is over, why don't we move on to another problem, is making a big mistake. We have years and years of work to do on this. Thank you very much, Dr. Fauci. You're welcome. In Washington, I'm Michael Smith, MedPage Today.